I was muted. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much for for inviting me. Yeah, I mean, for me, I mean, it's always very interesting and challenging to think about uh, uh, the vernacular, as it's something that I've been thinking and try to theorize for some time from an anthropological perspective. I mean, and today I'm aware that uh, most of the speakers are, uh, in, I mean, scholars of uh, political theories of inter or, or intellectual history. So a bit of a different field, but I think there are quite a lot of um, kind of point of contact. And uh, uh, yes, so we're going to have four papers, brilliant papers, uh, 10 minutes presentation each. And, uh, and I please keep the time. So that will give us plenty of space for the discussion. After the four presentation, Martin uh, will do the discussion bit, and then we can open the floor for, for uh, questions and discussion. So the first paper, and I'm going in alphabetical order, is by Dr. Das Gupta. And it's going to be on the ascetic and the Baobali and the vernacular styles of uh, politics in, in India. And I'm very pleased to start with this uh, uh, paper as, a, as a, I mean, the Baobali and the figure of the boss is something that I've been quite interested in recently. And this part of my kind of latest fieldwork. So uh, Dr. Das Gupta teaches at um, JNU in New Delhi at the Center for Political Studies. And he did his PhD in, uh, in uh, Oxford. And uh, basic, basically, is the main uh, research interest uh, and publication address history of Indian left, urbanization, culture, and politics, refugees' histories in South Asia. And uh, yes, many interesting pu in, uh, publications, uh, among which uh, uh, Rhythm Revolution, Marxism and Culture in Colonial Bengal, The Ascetic Modality, a Critique of Communist Success. Uh, session is in a, in a critical studies in politics, exploring size, selves, and powers, an added volume, and uh, uh, other pieces in ethics and politics in uh, Indian political thought, another added volume. And his recent publication include the Frontier Urbanism, Urbanization Beyond Cities in South Asia, co authored with uh, uh, Gurunani in Economic and Political Weekly. And uh, finally, he has a, a recent paper in Capital in Bangla, Post-Colonial Translation of Marx, in, a, in another edit volume, Capital in the East, a Reflection on, on Marx. So, uh, yes, please, we're going to have 10 minutes of uh, uh, presentation. So now is, uh, yeah, I'm just going to time it. And I'm going to intervene if you go, you start to go beyond it. <laughs> okay. Please, please do that. Thank you very much. I hope I'm audible. And thank you very much for those generous words of introduction. Um, as you can see, your work has been um, very much inspiring in what we are trying to do here. So without further ado, let me say that my paper basically tries to connect three things. Mm, the intellectual history of vernacular with uh, the rise of populist politics and uh, what Professor Micheluti has also described as the anthropology of democracy in the post-colonial context specifically. A few words about some common threads that run through our panel, all the papers. Our panel approaches uh, this idea of vernacular in broadly two ways. Two of the papers tracked late colonial histories of what can be described as kind of a project of standardizing the vernacular for an emerging public sphere and academic discourse. The projects which have in some sense failed. However, they have left behind some legacies, especially in terms of thinking about the relationship of language and social experience, which we believe holds the key to a new kind of sensibility that is shaping the political in India today. And this new sensibility is the other way in which the two other papers of this panel approach the vernacular and my, my paper takes this later approach. We can see how the grammar of politics and its language are changing around us. And we are partly trying to map this present and partly looking for a genealogy of this present in this panel. Overall, the attempt is to have a transdisciplinary conversation in some sense in this absolutely wonderful workshop. And we are delighted to present our works here my own work is in progress. Now, more specifically, my paper engages with vernacular styles of politics. And I primarily talk here about two different modalities, 
One is the ascetic modality, and the other is the Bahubali modality, which once again, um, Professor Michelitri's work describes as the boss man or the strong man of leadership and politics as illustrations of these styles. I briefly discuss a couple of cases and comparisons in what follows, and then I flag the coming together of these two styles or modalities, the ascetic and the Bahubali in an emerging third style that combines elements of the first two in projecting a new kind of national leader and especially uh, what can be seen as a new style of political communication that is being celebrated in the current populist term of politics. So let me very briefly give you a sense of the ascetic modality, as I call it. My longer paper, uh, which I had submitted, actually cites a pamphlet issued by an ultra-left Indian party, uh, somewhat of a Naxalite communist party some years back. I'm not going into the detail of this pamphlet for the lack of time. It basically helps to frame the figure of a true communist in a manner that I think has remained more or less the same for 80 years now. It basically shows a style of self-fashioning that illustrates a kind of political leadership, which I believe cuts across parties and ideologies. Now, in this case, the true standards of a communist are spelt out in the pamphlet, mainly, and this is what I want to draw your attention to, in terms of a severe and ascetic self-cultivation. It is somewhat akin to a renunciatory brahmacharya uh, whose objective is, in this case, to overcome the individual private sense of the self. Now, needless to add that this transformation is far from easy to achieve, and it calls for an everyday process of struggling and hardening oneself that characterizes, in this case, the communist lifestyle, but which could be extended across ideological divisions. So a similar manner of ascetic modality can be found, for example, in Gandhian activists who are trained in a different kind of monastic, ashramic kind of life. For example, the well-known Maharashtrian leader Anna Hazare, who had led the anti-corruption movement that gave rise to the Aadmi Party, which is currently ruling Delhi. At a formal level, indeed, this idiom of asceticism stretches across ideological camps. And one might say there is, in some sense, a common language game that is being played out in so far as this style of politics and leadership is concerned, which stretches to, for example, the RSS Pracharaks, uh, quite a few of the central ministers uh, in the current regime who take pride in their renunciatory discipline of Brahmacharya. And it also cuts across genders to include figures like Sadhvi Uma Bharti and Ritambara. So that's very briefly what I have in mind as the ascetic modality. Now, the second modality that I have in mind is the Bahubali modality, which I'm sure all of us are more familiar with. Um, and it is referred to in Hindi as Bahubali, or in Professor Michaluti's work, Dabang is the word that she chooses to use. And her work has already established this figure of the local boss man in a cross cultural and comparative context. My typology is of course indebted to her scholarship, but I mainly draw upon the work of a young political scientist, Amitan Shuvarma, who provides us with exciting ethnographic accounts of a series of such figures like Raja Bhaiya from Kunda in UP and Mukhtar Ansari and several others. Now such figures are usually regarded as criminal politicians and they are treated as aberrations by political scientists, but Verma has demonstrated how this competence for violence is painstakingly accumulated like a currency of leadership in certain contexts. And it is not simply mindless force, but it is calculated display of power, often including ritual performance that establishes a sense of personal sovereignty of the Bahubali over a certain area, that prompts then regional or national parties to bargain with him. The meanings of politics in such context, as pointed out by anthropologists again, are often shaped by the dynamics of caste, religion, and community customs, 
as well as local idioms of martial prowess, tradition of sports like wrestling or kushti, and lower caste assertions through Akhara culture, besides subaltern modes of representation like Nautanki performances. The case of Raja Bhaiya could be specific to Kunda in UP, but you know, scholarships like Professor Michelotti's work on the Dabang figure of Raghu Yadav, for example, and similar works on the figure of Bhau, Mumbai, Gunda, and Mastan in Eastern India show up that this modality is quite critical to vernacular styles of politics on the ground. Now, if we accept these two modalities, that of the ascetic and the Bahubali as two major available styles of politics and leadership, then we can begin to outline a third style emerging today. I believe that we are witnessing a set of new leaders and a new style of politics in this regard that connects these older available styles to the current rise of populism. The fleshing out of this new style, of course, needs much more work than I've done, but we can turn to the changes in the language of political communication to get a preliminary sense uh, at this moment. And a key indicator, I believe, is the particular tone, the image makeovers, and the, in a literal sense, the vocabulary of political communication, especially in the recent electoral campaigns, including the ongoing one. There are additional factors here like social media and IT cells of different parties, but even making room for them, one can identify the deliberate projection of a new kind of leader who personifies a kind of authoritarian populism that is on the rise. This is very clear from the shift in the rhetoric of political speeches and gestures increasingly used by such leaders. And let me just flag very briefly two aspects. The first is a certain coarseness and heightened aggression in communication, which not only devours the more sober actors, but also rules out reasoned deliberation entirely from politics as such. This is, I believe, an immediate translation of Bahubal into Vakyabal. That is a discursive translation of violence into political speech and exchange where temperance or sobriety can come across as weakness. The second aspect is a new play, or perhaps one might say a gamification of language that contains the threat of an indefinite and clandestine exchange of violence as the core of real politic. As such, it calls for a different kind of stamina and brutality that alone can provide the capacity for retaliation and maneuvers in the game of politics. This is where I think the ascetic self-cultivation comes into play. The union of Bahubali and Brahmachari conjugation in some sense signal a third style of vernacular politics and leadership in making, which can be described as the ascetic boss man. I believe there are a range of leaders today that can fit into this typology, ranging from Yogi Adityanath in UP to Mamata Banerjee in West Bengal, to those they emulate and or challenge in the checkered landscape of Indian politics. I believe that there are more types and styles that need to be identified to get a better grip over the dynamics of changing democratic politics. But it is also necessary to grasp the conceptual implications and historical provenances of these styles, something I have very briefly hinted here with the backgrounds of Akhara culture and ashram for this paper. And finally, to conclude, despite the limitation of heuristic devices like typologies, I do think that they offer an important conceptual purchase over the process that is better than institutional or formal political theory, certainly normative political theory. So the typology I've tried to illustrate with these three modalities for the sake of presenting a convenient and simple schematic is of course in need of further sophistication, elaboration and differentiation. It is a work in progress. I'm hoping that the comments will help me to develop the arguments further. But regardless of the schematic nature, I believe this typology can help us to think through the nuances where the vernacular meets 
the question of democracy in India and op can open up a new dialogue between political theory and the exciting field of anthropology of democracy. So I'll stop there. I hope I've kept to the time. Thank you. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you very much. I mean, you were pretty much on time, very good. I'm really impressed. <laughs> and uh, uh, nice talk. And I'm looking forward for the discussion. I have a few questions. But uh, let's uh, uh, move on now. Second paper, another exciting paper entitled The Vernacularizing the Political and an Exploratory Note by Professor Asha Sarangi who is, uh, um, she's currently chairperson and professor at the Center for Political Studies at GENU in New Delhi. And uh, she did her PhD at the University of Chicago and she holds uh, various prestigious fellowship and visiting professors at, at the, among the uh, other many places at the University of Edinburgh, for example. And her research areas include uh, uh, state, political and cultural economy of development, identity, identity and politics in South Asia, and specifically linguistic nationalism in modern India. She has written widely on these topics in added volumes and journals and published publish extensively in peer review um, journals on the politics of language, nationalism, minority representation, like linguistic identity in colonial India and uh, um, the organization of states in independent India. She, she's, she has edited uh, Language and Politics in India and uh, co-edited interrogating, interrogating the Organization of the State, Culture, Identity and Politics in India. And more recently, she authored a new introduction to VP Men on Integrations of Indian States. So uh, as I said, the title of the paper is Vernacularizing the Political. And I'm really looking forward to this uh, presentation and this kind of new ideas put on the table. Professor Sarangi, you'll have to unmute. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, I would like to begin by thanking Professor Lucia Mistroletti uh, for being the chair and Dr. Martin Bailey for our panel. Um, I would also like to begin by thanking the organizers who I think have put together an excellent uh, 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 sort of conference on this theme, which I think is extremely uh, time uh, uh, relevant and also something that we continue to see on an everyday level particularly during the time when we are going to phase four assembly elections, when we see how the electoral battles actually are in the, as my preceding, um, uh, uh, you know, sort of panelist, Dr. Rajesh Gupta said, some kind of language gamification that one sees uh, on an everyday basis. Since I have very limited time of 10 minutes, let me get into the paper. Uh, it is something that I'm still thinking through, but the term vernacularization prompts um, you know, uh, me to think about the idea of the political. Uh, so my paper therefore looks at the conceptual terrain of the term and how one should look at the multipolarity of it to understand the notion of the political culture and to make sense of the political anthropology of the democracy in India. I think uh, Dr. Rajesh Das Gupta already very, uh, in a very, very precise manner uh, summed up the focus of our panel, but also in some way showed us how our papers are interconnected. So after giving a very brief uh, introduction, that's why I call my paper as an exploratory note, uh, because it's something that I'm still thinking through. I follow it up with both ped pedagogical as well as the performative aspects of the term vernacular, which I collapse with both vernacularism and vernacularity. I'm not looking into the distinctiveness of these two. I use them interchangeably at this moment, which brings into focus the multiple domains of the politics. Furthermore, then I will look at vernacular politics as a distinctive kind of politics, uh, which suggests that it might help us to think through the notion of vernacular pluralism of some kind, 
which is or can be possibly part of political pluralism. And finally, if we can think about some idea of a vernacular political, which is very distinctive and which is yet to emerge in, in, a, in a more, uh, I think, substantial manner. So it's very much work in progress. So I think the comments will really help me to further think and refine it. Um, so let me get into the main uh, sort of body of the paper and illustrate some of the points that I want to uh, make before you. Uh, I want to suggest that uh, the multipolarity of vernacularism help, will help us to think through the notion of political culture. That's the first claim I want to make. And this idea of a political culture does not have very uniform language to begin with. It actually situates itself in a very heterosexual and heteronormative modes of expression. So that's where I want to bring in the idea of political culture, which is very different from what the literature of the 60s uh, suggests. I think we have moved to a time where the idea of culture itself has been uh, problematized in, 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 in many ways. So the larger contention then at work is that political democracy in India cannot be made sense of today without a new analytical framing of the concept of vernacularism. In the discipline of social sciences, particularly because this term vernacular has traveled from let's say linguistics or literary studies or cultural studies, it questions what I would like to call and which Rudolphs have already written about the imperialism of categories and their locational primacy. So vernacularism helps us to look at the local idiomatic expressions and, uh, and, and significance of it. The new literary forms, narratives, styles of prose, poetry, and historical communicational aesthetics in the forms of, you know, dastangoi that one knows about, or kissas, there has been a um, lot of work uh, in the recent past on the Dastangoi kissas, which are forms of uh, narratives which have long historical genealogy. Rajat or Rathyatras, this is kind of religious pilgrimage of caravan of uh, you know, religious pilgrimages in different parts of the country. I'm thinking of Odisha and Uttarakhand, where Rathyatra and Rajatra are very, very prominently part of the local traditions over long period of time, they in some way capture the life world of vernaculars across regions and states of India. The language of political culture, if one connects it to the idea of vernacularism, finds new vocabularies in the uses of vernaculars used at home, marketplaces, transactional sites of land and labor in the affective ties of religious congregation, love, pain, and suffering. The multilingual dialogical interaction that one can look at in Sufism, in Buddhism, in Bhakti traditions, among others, uh, brought the idea of vernaculars in the front forefront while establishing communicational ethos with their followers or community of believers. The print capitalism, as Anderson told us, brought in the forms of vernacularism in the spheres of his school textbooks, popular periodicals, newspapers, and numerous literary treatises. A number of ethno-linguistic and regional movement that uh, emerged in India in late 19th century onwards also brought forth a certain form of political culture emerging in a set of political practices, institutions, and discourses of power. So all of this can be seen leading up to the emergence of some sort of vernacular modernity, if one can use this term, as an alternative form of modernity. The argumentative tradition I would like to suggest available in this kind of vernacular pluralism, if one can now sort of think through this term, were able to contest the imperial hegemonic structures of domination and subordination. The vernacular traditions that I just stated through Buddhism and, and Sufism and Bhakti tradition uh, brought in and socially legitimized the discourses of dissent and debate in multiple ways. I don't have time to get into it, but I think uh, what I mean to say is there is a, there is a huge tradition of work and, and very, very uh, scholarly uh, works available on it. The disciplinary regimes, however, of state power and in their institutional habitations 
in archives, academia, schools, universities, and prisons, among others, proved more effective through vernaculars, the kind of uses of vernaculars that one sees in the registers of these institutions, which also provided much needed innovativeness and inventiveness in performing both pedagogical and performative tasks in politics. Here, I would just like to say that I don't want to reduce the term vernacular only to a linguistic register, even though predominantly it is so, but how vernac the uses of vernacular or the manner in which vernacularism has entered both the institutional and non-institutional spheres also has established a kind of pedagogical task or pedagogical effect in politics. So it becomes both a pedagogical as well as a performative in uh, performing the task. Thirdly, the vernaculars explore and expose the word of Cyril's pigeons, hybrid and heteroglossic languages. Vernacularity in that sense shows us the road to alterity and transgression often beyond the order and the homogeneous. So this is the uh, a sort of a disruptive or you can say irregular or, or dissecting a task of the vernacularity. As uh, <clears throat> Shelley Pollock tells us, and I think I have also drawn upon Professor Lucia Michelet's work, uh, which of course has been very inspiring to think through, uh, but I would just like to quote here Pollock's one uh, small uh, passage from his work that the non-modern non-West is the one where the peculiar self-fashioning is through the vernacular distinction of persons and places. And thus developing the relationship between vernacular poetry and vernacular polity, characteristic of modern South Asia. So I think we can go back and look at the older debate between English and non-English languages globally, but also between English and Indian languages within the context of India. I don't have time, but I think this is one um, scale where we can actually situate the, the, the vernacularism and its, its, its expense. So vernacularism has therefore entered the realm of politics. The communicative word of politics has seen uses of tropes, metaphors, and analogies in various regional languages and their dialectal forms. I mean, reading Professor uh, Lucia Michelotti's book, Vernacularization of Indian Democracy, was absolute delight because she draws upon these entire repertoire of linguistic tropes and how that actually comes into the center stage of describing the vernacularity of Indian politics, Indian democracy. So the political oratory, which I think is a very, very useful a uh, lens through which we can look at the vernacularization process at work has acquired newer forms and idioms suggesting a novel kind of cognitive pluralism based on the diversity of social experiences. This is suggestive of setting up the relationship between democracy and communication, something I think uh, Dr. Rajushri Dasgupta was also talking about in his paper in a mutually collaborative manner, forming the genre of political imaginers involving dialogical and discursive forms of public sphere. The signifying literariness of these multiple spheres also acts as sites of resistance against hegemonic forms of control expressed through these uses of dominant languages. Now, if one look at the way in which, let's say, uh, we find the battle between English and Sanskritized Hindi on the one hand and lesser known or regional or marginalized languages on the other, we see that there is a kind of a hegemonic power structure based on upper class caste nexus, which gets reinforced through social and cultural hierarchies of various sorts. The Dalit intellectuals, for example, have of late challenged this kind of English and Sanskritized Hindi hegemonic hold of languages in its capacity to articulate and subvert the relations of power and have argued vociferously for the vernacular languages to be recognized as new sites of Dalit assertion. The radical democratic potential needs to be vernacularized, I would like to say, to acquire different and diverse meanings located in the world views of different castes, communities, cultures, and people. This is something I think uh, as, as, as uh, a matter of uh, 
uh, sort of alternative way of thinking about the radical democratic. The democratization process itself needs to be located within this larger domain of the vernacularism, which defies any neat theoretical explanations to describe the dynamics of the popular politics, politics of dissent and consent, of resistance and of radical transformation. So the term vernacularism actually enables us to look at these ways of uh, the potential of the new politics uh, emerging. So what we see in vernaculars is the capacity to build up homogeneous concept of modernity as both a historical as well as a political project, which can provide a cross-cultural comparative interdisciplinary and methodologically plural framework. This is what probably uh, uh, I would like to suggest as a matter of, um, uh, you know, so something that one can think through. The desacralization of Latin that, you know, Anderson works uh, powerfully argues with the, but the desacralization of Latin uh, through Benedict Anderson's imagined communities was accompanied by the literization of regional languages in the 19th century Europe, uh, but it did not find the exact parallel historical process in 19th century India. What emerged rather was a discursive and dialogical vernacular public sphere, uh, brought, which brought forth the word of cultural significations in making sense of the new publics, which this new public was supposed to be discursive, collective, I would say, and communicational in nature. And you see this, when you look at, I think Iman's uh, presentation will bring it uh, much more, but when you look at the kind of periodical uh, literature that emerged in 19th century India, that certainly suggests that there was a vibrant collective and communicational uh, discursive uh, public emerging. So all of this can help us define the political and social imaginaries of our contemporary times, which open up the new domains of participatory democracy, and they also familiarize us with uses and reuses of certain idioms and political languages of rhetoric, words, and images. I don't have time to get into it in each of these, but I think the, so, so one can look at the associationality between these. The vernaculars in this instance become not simply instrumental devices to set up the communicational network, but they open up a world of symbolic and material relations and their representational forms. In this exercise, then, the everydayness and the ordinariness of the political become important, whereby vernacularism exposes us to the political anthropology of the state power. The vernacular political, now I'm using it as one word with the hyphen in between, emerging out of the complex web of above stated forces is suggestive of the fact that in a multilingual society, a few languages or vernaculars will definitely become languages of control, command, and capital. So the, the struggle of the domination and subordination, even in the linguistic sphere, will continue. The new domains of vernacular politics then, and its centrality in the democratic life of the Indian state, will draw upon both the heterotextual and intertextual social diversity around to interpret the newer modes of the political through their processes of negotiation and arbitration among the competing communities and their respective claims. The plurality of Indian cultures, traditions, and histories can be brought together through this kind of vernacular heteroglossia. The dialogical pluralism in some way that Bhakti talks about, or even to some extent Gramsci had alerted to, remains at the heart of this kind of intellectual radicalism, which can provide us with adequate analytical tools to articulate and make sense of the social, cultural, and political differences in contemporary India. So I call this, uh, uh, this kind of, uh, uh, you know, the-, the, the uh, Asha, we have to use this, sorry? Not, sorry, Asha, we are kind of going over time. So okay. if you can wrap it up. Okay. okay. I will. I will cut short my presentation. Yeah, so, because you're already five minutes of work. All right, okay. Uh, well, in that sense, uh, I mean, I was suggesting that one could use uh, something like Bactinian dialogical pluralism to characterize 
the kind of canvas of vernacularism that I'm talking about. Um, and this, this, this vernacular public sphere then um, would also uh, in some way uh, bring before us the location of the political in the project of vernacularization. I don't have time, therefore I will uh, skip uh, a section of my paper. Um, in conclusion, let me just say that vernacular political, if this is uh, something that we can think through, will make different historical claims and counterclaims based on the recovery of memory, traditions, local practices, and chronological events woven into the narratives of the past uh, and new genres of literature, art, aesthetics, language, and the literary forms, which would emerge to disrupt and dissect the distinction between classical and vernacular, between elite and popular, and between colonial and the post-colonial. So in, in, in nutshell, we can say that vernacularizing politics and political will be made in and through the vernacular's worldviews, their habitus, pedagogical and performative uses in the everyday theatrical art of political persuasion and even portion. What we need to then consider is the uses of certain idioms, satires, ironies, metonymic uses of particular languages, tropes, in our political discourses. And what can then emerge is the politics and the politics of the performance of democracy. In this, uh, I will skip, I had quoted Professor Michelotti from her work. I can skip that and also a few other things. But all I want to say is that vernaculars should not be seen simply as depositories of traditions, local histories, indigenous belief systems and values. Rather, they are at the cusp of global and local entanglements of modernity or multiple modernities, if you want to call it, and they are indicative of global and cosmopolitan provenance. They can provide some kind of a liminal space between localism and globalism, and in making a shift from a referential to indexical uses of linguistic registers of various sort. So I think I'll end it here. Yes, thank, thank you, so Sasha. Thank you. thank you very much. I think we're going to have more time to discuss it if you cut sure. it. I'm sorry to cut you, down, cut you, but okay. we have a very limited time. And uh, so now we, we have a paper on the concept of Dharma and uh, in the vernacular imaginary of Hindu nationalism in between 1817 and 1920 by uh, Dr. Moinder Singh. And Moinder Singh teaches, teaches, teaches political thought at the Center for Comparative Politics uh, uh, and uh, Political Theory at GNU in Delhi. And he mainly works on the history of political thought in modern India. And uh, his recent research and ma major publication has been uh, on the study of Hindi as a language of political discourse in the late 19th and early 20th century in North India focusing on social, on social and political um, uh, concepts. And uh, yes, so we're looking forward to hear something on the concept of Dharma. And uh, off to you, uh, Winder. If you try to be on 10 minutes, it will be great. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, uh, Lucia. Uh, I thank the organizers uh, for including this panel uh, and uh, the chair and the discussion for agree to the chair and discussing. Now, uh, in, this, in this, uh, this paper is part of a project uh, in which I am trying to trace uh, some sort of conceptual prehistory of Hindu nationalism uh, by going to reformist and uh, Sanatani movements and those, uh, the imaginaries they created. Uh, the scope of the concept of dharm, uh, even in its conceptualization in in these in this social imaginary, is is quite wide. So I'm limiting here uh, this to uh, to the relation between this conceptualization of dharm and to the conceptualization of samaj. And my main hunch and research question is: Is there a correspondence between conceptualizations of these two key concepts in this social imaginary, dharma and samaj, and I think there is. Uh, so let me try to uh, just see if there are, uh, what kinds of evidences there are. 
Uh, now the the common term that they they both uh, both these conceptualizations uh, are trying to uh, uh, they they are trying to transcend uh, a, some sort of a common uh, conceptual uh, let's say opponent here uh, in relation to dharm you uh, it, this is mat uh, mat is translated as uh, religion doctrine creed uh, and uh, and in relation to social communities it is uh, all the conceptual terms that correspond to the the concept of sect so this is this is what i am trying to think uh, and uh, for this paper the the i have basically dealt with so far the late 19th century arya samaji and sanatani intellectuals so the, the work is uh, still in the early stage uh, and among the arya samaji uh, uh, leaders uh, or intellectuals so i have dealt with uh, swami dayanand's work uh, uh, lala munshi ram who later becomes swami shraddhanand and also uh, from sanatani side uh, bhartendu harishchandra and uh, uh, some other intellectuals uh, of that period okay uh, now richard fox in his book resistant hinduism talks at great length uh, uh, this question of translation uh, between religion and uh, equivalent uh, uh, sanskrit terms and he is dealing with uh, uh, the site of translation uh, in early 19th century there's kind of some sort of um, doctrinal disputation between the sanskrit pandits and the missionaries who also write in sanskrit uh, people like john moyer so and he talks about uh, this translations that they both are engaging in in sanskrit so uh, mat is in this discourse is translated as both religion and doctrine or creed or even darshanas uh, whereas religion is translated as both dharm and mat so it's a kind of uh, you know there is no complete consistency here but he tells us two more things here uh, one is that uh, dharm mostly uh, refers to although it's also translated as religion uh, just like mat is uh, uh dharm refers more to practical aspect of conduct within a community whereas mat is much more connected to the intellectual noetic theoretical or doctrinal part uh, in the explicit sense of of uh, of, uh, of the doctrine right now uh, one more thing i wish to say before i move on to the analysis of material is that in the social imaginary uh mat actually refers to uh, the social imaginary that i am analyzing mat refers to both doctrines as well as uh, sects uh, so this is uh, uh, and this this becomes relevant for understanding the conceptualization uh, of both dharm and uh, and samaj in 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 this social imaginary so now coming to second part which is the conceptualization of dharm in the vernacular social imaginary of hindu nationalism and in this uh, conceptualization i look at basically three things uh, or three uh, features of this conceptualization one is conceptualization of dharm as universal religion uh, this is something uh, that has been discussed in various uh, several important works in recent times about uh, the the discourse of universal religion in the 19th century originating in the in the science of comparative religion so uh, with reference to arya samaj uh, of course uh, c s adcock's work is very important uh, limits of tolerance torkel break uh, the creators of uh, uh, modern uh, uh, modern religion in in hinduism arvind sharma faisal devsi has also written about universal uh, religion in relation to muslim intellectuals uh, okay so there are of course the what i'm talking about is the competing claims of uh, religious universality originating in the science of comparative religion as i said so in in uh, uh, this is there are a lot of i mean this this is all around in this uh, in all over uh, this this idea of universal uh, religion in this discourse 
Swami Dayanand, for example, uh, in, uh, in this book, uh, Rigveda, the Bhash Bhumika, which was written in Sanskrit originally, then translated into Hindi, later on translated into English as well. Uh, he, he writes uh, in this chapter, which is like Dharma according to the Vedas, he writes, I quote, God has thus preached the Dharma for the sake of all men in great number of Vedic mantras. This is the only Dharma for all men. There is not second Dharma different or separate from it. Unquote. So there is a, a there is so there is kind of strong emphasis of Ved Ved as the only source of truth or Dharma. And truth is is uh, Dayanand's way of uh, elaborating the concept of. Uh, uh, or the, 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 what is there in the Ved, right? So similarly in Bharti Hindu Arishandra, Vaishnav Dharma is presented as the true claimant of this universal status. And in later conceptualization of Dharma in Sanatan Dharma organizations, it is named as Sanatan Dharma. Uh, John Stroughton Hawley uh, in, in an essay, Sanatan Dharma as the 20th century began, Quotes from a official journal of Bharat Dharma Mahamandal, an organization founded in 1887 to coordinate the work of various North Indian uh, Sanatan Dharma Sabhas. And he quotes uh, from there, and I quote that, the Sanatan Dharma is not marked by any spirit of narrowness or exclusiveness. It is not a particular creed promising salvation to its followers alone, it is universal dharma for all mankind. Okay, so sec this is the first. Second dimension is dharma conceptual distinction. Uh, so Swami Dayanand's framing of this question in Satyat Prakash is around the question of truth. Truth of truth, here I'm writing truth with, with capital T. Truth of the Vedas versus all other partial perspectives. So this is the opposition through which uh, uh, Dayanand reduces any other claim to uh, uh, some sort of truth as partial perspective. Only Ved gives us the universal and total complete perspective. That is, that is what he called Ved. And therefore he suggests that uh, this all other doctrines, sects, sampradayas, uh, creeds, they, they are all false and they must accept the truth of the Vedas and thus uh, become part of the true Arya Dharma. Right. The third aspect is the separation of the matters of community identities and interests on the one hand and matters of belief and rituals on the other. So this is the uh, main evidence for this is in Bhartindu Harishindra where he says the religion is a matter of dharma, is a matter of heart on the other hand. So private uh, matter, uh, whereas uh, also at the same time saying that, uh, uh, you know, the Hindu community should unite and going beyond all the, its sampradayas, mat and, and, and creeds, etc. So this is, this is a contradiction that emerges uh, in Bhartindu Arishandra, some sort of inconsistency. But here I take recourse to Talala Saab, uh, in his distinction, uh, the distinction that he makes between uh, uh, and that, that distinction that characterizes the modern public sphere where religious beliefs relegated to the private realm could exist uncoursed, but alongside this and simultaneously differentiation and hier hierarchy emerged among religious identities. So this is this is uh, uh, this is this this is the this is my way of interpreting that. Now uh, at the same time, there is always this contradiction and undecidability, both among the Arya Samajis and um, Sanatanis, uh, between uh, say uh, the Hindu nationalist and universalist scopes of the Dharma that they are trying to conceptualize. Okay, third part is where I am trying to relate this conceptualization of dharma to conceptualization of samaj in this uh, discourse. And there basically I am trying to contrast this concept of samaj in 19th and 20th century to pre-19th pre century, you can say pre-colonial uh, concepts of community. Okay, so the works that deal with uh, uh, this, these communities uh, 
uh, like by Ellen Fisher, uh, uh, Anne Charlotte Eshman, Stoughton Holley, Christian Notsky, and others. They basically are uh, mostly, I mean, they, some of them use the, the analytical concept of sect and sectarianism, not in pejorative sense, but in a positive sense, uh, having foundations within Hinduism. Uh, the the self-reference, self-referencing concept of, of communities that are found in these works is Sampradayas, Marg, Dharm, Mat, all of that is there. Sampradaya emerges as the main concept uh, of self-referencing community, uh, but there are Mat also, uh, Marg also. Now Samaj is not very much in, uh, in, 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 in use there. In, in whereas in 19th century and in early 20th century and even now this is this is a very important concept. So for Samaj in pre-colonial situations, I get uh, uh, help from say one book is by Daya Krishna, Problematic and Conceptual Structure of Classical Indian Thought about Man, Society and Polity, where he says that the term of uh, you know the Samaj that was traditionally used in classical Sanskrit sources. Uh, had a very different sense than uh, uh, what is meant by social today. And it was closer to the word that is now conveyed by Nagarika that is cultured or civilized uh, you know, as understood. Uh, so that's, 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 that's the kind of scope of that, referential scope of that concept, according to Daya Krishna. Uh, Parthasarthi Banerjee, uh, 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 writing on 19th century uh, pandits in Bengal uh, in an essay called Interlocutors with Social Studies and Society as an Object of Inquiry. He says that the Samaj was much more about uh, the, the, uh, the intelligentsia, that is the pandit uh, uh, dealing with the local communities. And he argues that the co-production of rasa-based Aesthetic communion with their audience was the means through which traditional practice of knowledge produced and reproduced uh, community existence. And uh, I quote one line from that, uh, that essay. Uh, he writes, the tasting of rasa must be in communion, samajika, and in interaction. And thus Pandit rendition reproduce samaja and samajika, unquote. This is again uh, very similar to what Daya Krishna is saying, very uh, part of some sort of aesthetic communion. Uh, that is what makes Samaj. Whereas in modern conceptualizations, uh, Samaj is primarily, it emerges primarily as an object of reform and transformation. And the position of the inquirer seems to be uh, very often outside the object of inquiry. This is what uh, uh, Partha Sarsi Banerjee is saying is not the case with traditional intellectuals. So this, sorry, this is Mohinder, Mohinder, sorry, you're okay. over time. Uh, can I just read out my arguments? Um, so you just can argument. wrap, up, wrap up quickly because you're yes, about yes. 10 minutes. Uh, yeah, thank you. Sorry, sorry about yeah. that. Okay, I have two uh, uh, arguments here. Uh, as the main, as the imperative, imperative of unity involved debates on authentic canons of textual authority and new conceptualization of dharma among the Hindu leaders, it is not difficult to see the correspondence between the conceptualizations of Samaj and Dharm, both in terms of both in terms of transcendence of the sectarian. Uh, yet compared, okay, so that I skip. And the last argument is that the general historiographic argument that emerges from this conceptual history exercise is that the assumption of replacement of one social formation by another in terms of a complete break or discontinuity assumes a historicist notion of temporality that has been critiqued variously in favor of a more complex notion of temporality that admits of simultaneous existence of multiple temporalities at any given time. Uh, Okay, uh, it is important to notice that the new conceptualization of dharma and social communities to, do perform functions crucial for the politics of emergent Hindu nationalism. And that the success of such a conceptual function neither depends on nor requires the replacement of other religious and social concepts and practices. Thank you. And done. Thank you very much, Moinder. Sorry about for interrupting you, yes, but we are running out of time. Sorry. I'm sorry about that. <laughs> uh, so now we have another brilliant paper 
which is entitled Researching Experience, Archiving the Vernacular, and, uh, and Experiment in, in um, Early 20th Century. And uh, uh, that's the moment that in the, in the process I lost the, the bios. Sorry about that. It's okay, Professor Nicholetti, I can introduce myself. No, no, don't worry. I mean, I know about where you where you are, but I, just three seconds and I'm, I'm on it. Uh, okay, so I, Iman Mitra is an assistant professor at, in the Department of History at Shivnadar University. And his research interests include history of economic discipline, economic history and political economy of South Asia, state and non-state networks of dissemination of economic knowledge, and uh, especially in, colon in colonial and post-colonial contexts. And uh, as well, uh, his research looks at, at the issues of, of urbanization and informal economies in the global South. His latest publication is titled Marx's Theory of Rent, a Speculative Reading, and is in the edited volume by Chiracaborti, entitled Capital in the East, Reflection on Marx. And uh, so, to you. Thank you very much for uh, your presentation. And if you can stay in ten, in 10 minutes time, that will be great because otherwise we're not going to have much time for discussion, which I'm sure that everybody wants to ask questions. Yeah, I will try my best. Uh, Professor Thank <laughs> Thanks. You. And, uh, it, it's great to be part of this conference as well as this panel. And uh, I would like to thank the organizers and they're doing a wonderful job. Uh, so let me go directly to the paper without wasting any more time. Uh, so, as you know, the title of the paper is Researching Experience, Archiving the Vernacular, an Experiment in Early 20th Century. Uh, so, in this paper, I shall talk about a research project in early 20th century Bengal, carried out by Binay Kumar Sharkar, a prolific intellectual of that time, and his research initiative, Bongyo Dhanubigan Porishad, or to be translated as Bong Bengal Economic Association. I shall argue that Sharkar's decisive contribution to the study of social sciences in India is his unique method of research, which address the tension between universal historical reason and specific local conditions creatively and in the most ingenious manner by proposing a combination of two histories of life, the diverse life histories of individual economic agents and a unique life history of the nation. I shall argue in this paper that this combination was proposed by facilitating a two-way translation mechanism between experience and data and archiving the outcomes across different registers of dissemination of knowledge more specifically in academic and semi-academic publications and insurance databases. This in turn produced a vernacular domain which was not restricted to literal transfer of meaning from one language to another, but assimilation, displacement, and refiguration of concepts and ideas from the original. As part of Dhanavik Ganpurishad, many young scholars would embrace this research method and contribute to formalization of the economic vernacular in early 20th century. Now, Binay Sharkar's intellectual career was spread over almost all the branches of social science. Like many of his contemporaries in the early 20th century who wrote on economic issues, he was trained in history, philosophy, and literature in his university days. After completing his master's from the Calcutta University, he joined the national education movement in the first decade of the uh, 20th century under the influence of Shotish Mukherjee, the editor of the famous Dawn magazine. Under Mukherjee's tutelage, Sharkar read Herbert Spencer, John Stuart Mill, and Thomas Carlyle in the meetings of the Dawn Society, a subsidiary forum for academic discussions. Now, soon, Sharkar became involved in the uh, National Council of Education movement, which embraced both the ideas of compulsory technical education and training in the vernaculars. In 1914, he left for England with Lala Lajpat Rai on a mission to raise awareness about colonial rule in India and traveled to Germany, Italy, and Japan. 11 years and a couple of books later, in 1925, he came back to Calcutta and started publishing a journal called Arthik Unmati, uh, uh, which needs to be, which, which can be translated as economic improvement, uh, which will be, which was completely in Bengali and entirely devoted to economic issues of the country. So in the previous year, when Sharkar was living in Italy, he prepared a draft of a society exclusively devoted to economic research in Bengali and published it in, in the influential magazine Probashi. In 1928, the society, now named the Bungiya Dhanavik Ganpurishad, a Bengal Economic Association, started its journey with Vinay Sharkar as its director. Apart from the usual topics covered by the economic discipline, the newly founded Purishad claimed to have initiated a forum for discussing other various subjects, 
especially those that were formerly a part of the broader canvas of social sciences, such as democracy, public health and efficiency, urban and rural development, etc. The journal Artikunnati was made into its official mouthpiece, but the papers presented at the Purishad would be published. Few enthusiastic young men were taken by Sharkar under his wings and were inculcated to be members of the Purishad. Soon they started presenting papers on as diverse subjects as the future of the seed oil industry in India, the reforms of the post office bank law, or the economic views of Mahatma Gandhi. So diversity of research interests was encouraged as an institutional policy. In many of his articles on the methodology of research in social science, uh, Sharkar emphasized the importance of gathering obhigata or experience by visiting the interiors of the social space of the working population of Bengal, get acquainted with their work processes and contrast these with the received wisdom of archaic theories. The rural space of sociality was projected simultaneously as the space of economic interpretation. This mode of interpretation also anticipated a social and economic reconfiguration, and this reconfiguration was to be understood in terms of an interaction between new information and experience. The notion of experience was centrally located in the sphere of building expertise, therefore. The expert had to reach out to the domain of experience, and the domain of experience was characterized by social transformation of a massive scale. The element of transformation in Sharkar's vision adopted the metaphor of a laboratory, where the translation of experience into information was giving birth to a concept of data. In an account of the research program of the Purishad, he compared the researchers with the chemists who fidgeted with the gases, poisons, and medicine in the laboratory and asserted that the economists too had to create a laboratory space of their own, where the raw materials of analysis would be the thoughts and experiences of those directly involved in the economic activities, those who were doing the farming or running the banks themselves. Sharkar suggested that the studies of their jibon, which can be translated as both life and biography, should be the focus of research. The suggestion was implemented quite seriously in the pages of Arthik Unmati, where uh, they, in each issue, they devoted, they, they uh, printed interviews of people working in different sectors, from janitors to the famous social workers. So this was one of the processes how Experience became information, a great equalizer in the domain of social reconfiguration, although the play of rhetoric might be a little skewed according to the already established markers of cultural, intellectual, and social positions of the interview. Thus, the pronoun used for the janitor was a slightly derogatory to me in comparison with the respectful apni for a woman social worker like Lady Obalabasu. This mode of hierarchical repositioning of the interviewed was also the speciality of the vernacular domain where certain signs of difference might appear due to the problematic of untranslatability. The novelty of the new mode of socialization of experience data was that it could overcome this problem of untranslatability by initiating another process at the same time, how information itself became experience operating at the level of an organicist sociality the society conceptualized as a living organism, inscribing life on the so-called social body through various mechanisms of calculation practices. Sharkar, in many of his essays, emphasized the importance of systemic interactions between experience and calculability. In his demand for a meeting place of different registers of economic experience, he located statistics as an organizing principle, almost like a linguistic equivalent mediating between real experiences, prokita obhikkata, and theory or tattva. What he did not mention here was that the mediations themselves were to be made part of the archival inventory, archival inventory of experience. These mediations become palpable in the particular context of Purishad's research on life insurance, invoking a reversal of the translational movement from experience to data. In tandem with the experiential modality of research, the articles on insurance in Arthik Unmati were mostly penned by experts in the field, the agents or the owners of the agencies. In many of these articles, it was insisted that the science of life insurance must be corroborated by a regime of calculability, that is determination of the premium by calculating the death rate of a population. These calculations were to be performed by a group of experts called the actuarists. Every insurance agency thus needed to have a stock of data relating to the frequency of deaths in a country and prepare what was quite ironically called the life tables, a list of probabilities for people of different age groups of dying before their next birthday. Now, Surendranath Thakur, 
the Indian owner of the Hindustan Cooperative Insurance Company, whose interview was published in the Life Stories section of the journal, however, pointed out that despite having fixed the premium as low as possible, considering the poverty-ridden state of India, they could never be sure of the actual projection of the death rate as an Indian, quote-unquote, Indian life table was yet to exist, a table calculated by Indian experts calibrated to the specific conditions in the country. They had to send all the data to the experts in England who evaluated the information and stocked them in the cards for individual policies. I had a dream once, Taku sounded quite emotional towards the end of the interview, and I'm quoting you. I had a dream once, if all the Indian insurance companies come together to collaborate on preparing a life table by comparing their policies and sharing their experiences, the country will make unending progress. But sadly, we are yet to be inspired by the ideal of unity." Unquote. Although Thakur's account invokes the issue of commensurability of experience and information, it is markedly different from the other accounts written by the experts in the field. These accounts focus on the sciences of insurance replete with details as to how a fixed and stable regime of calculability, including disciplinary mechanisms of medical surveillance, informed the decisions regarding the premium. On the other hand, Thakur connected the same regime of calculability to a discourse of national capitalist aspirations. As it seems, there was a social in making which could bring together both impetuses, the drive to found a rationalized system of insurance and the aspiration to locate it in a network of the national capital, network of national capital, by producing an integrated and standardized national life table through sharing and comparing experiences of different companies operating in India. What was this experience? Obviously, Thakur was talking about a complete set of data defined, determined, and authenticated by the actuarial experts in a national context, a context which could only exist as a vernacular domain containing refiguration of a pre-given data set and anticipating archival interventions like collecting, stocking, and collating of the refigured, calibrated data within a network of like-minded national bourgeoisie. This was the moment when data became experienced by assuming a form that was primarily conceptualized in terms of population as a statistical category. I can stop here or I can uh, read out another paragraph of 200, 300 words maybe if I have time. Can I, Professor Nacharatni? Uh, I think it's better to wrap up. Okay, so then, then that's it. Yeah, no, no, thank you, thank you very much. Brilliant. So, I mean, uh, fantastic four presentations. And uh, of course, I mean, it would be lovely to have more time to be able to kind of uh, go further with the presentation. But I think it's good that we leave some time for discussion. And now, now Martin, Dr. Martin Bailey will provide you some uh, discuss, discuss uh, the, um, comments. But I'd like to ask uh, Shubhatri, how, when can, until what time can we go on? Because um, right now it's 10 to 18. Yeah, yeah, 18. Um, it would be great if we can wrap up by 2.35. 2.35, so it's very quick. Okay, we can, okay. It is so Mar Martin, over to you. And I suppose that probably a lot of the discussion will have to kind of uh, uh, end up to be in private emails of conversation if we have more kind of a uh, uh, type of type of comments and exchange to have. Uh, Martin. Thank you, Professor Michelotti, and thank you to, um, uh, to uh, the, the organizers, to the chair, the panelists. It's a, a fantastic that we can do this and, and you know, um, really encouraging to read these papers and see all these people together in this in this online environment. I'll be very quick. Um, to get out of the way, partly because I'm very much a student of these papers and their authors and the literature to which you're all um, speaking to. Uh, so I learned a lot from reading these papers and, and the comments come with a heavy dose of modesty um, in that sense as well. Um, I had two general comments that emerged as I was reading the papers and then more specific comments. So the first is, uh, and they both these general comments both relate to the themes of the conference, specifically writing the intellectual histories of global entanglements. So in each of your papers, there is some sort of gesture towards the transnational um, or towards some form of entanglement with other idioms, perhaps, um, maybe a gesture towards the global. And, and I wondered where your papers stand on this aspect of the theme of the conference. Where is the global in the vernacular? 
Uh, is this principally a comparative argument that we are making in these papers that we ought to be paying as close attention to these vernacular styles of politics as we do to European styles, for instance, as Samuel Moyne and Andrew Sartori point to as one, one meaning of global intellectual history? Um, or rather, are there connections, entanglements, circulations that we uh, should be highlighting in order to move beyond precisely that privileging um, and perhaps even fetishizing of, of the local? Uh, of the traditional. Um, and I raise this point partly in light of, um, of Pocock's critique, in fact, of Moyn and Sartori on the unglobality of context. So if one of the reasons we're paying attention to vernaculars is in order to highlight context, you know, contextualize meanings of the political, political concepts, um, then can we, through vernaculars, make a global argument? Uh, Moyn seems to, be, sorry, Sartori seems to be suggesting not, but it'd be very interesting to hear what you think about that. Um, the second general point is on temporalities, the histories aspect. You know, that each of the papers, perhaps some of them more than others, um, hint, hint at a temporality of, of political meaning, um, whether that's in the way in which meanings are recovered, for example, in Dr. Dasgupta's paper, um, or perhaps the way that meanings move through time, as in uh, with Dr. Singh's paper, um, so the temporality of concepts and, and the temporality of vernaculars is something that I, you know, I was interested to hear more on through your papers. So more specific points. And as I said, the, read these as comments um, rather than questions, since we have little time. So starting with Dr. Dasgupta, the, the paper puts it in, as an intellectual genealogy of the contemporary intersection of the vernacular and the post-colonial and post-colonial democracy in India. Um, the paper reads this through two modalities of vernacular politics, the ascetic and, and the Balbali, with a speculated third emergent in the present era of populist politics. So in that sense, the project embeds within it a strong presentist claim on the modalities of contemporary populist leaders in India. But is there perhaps more to say on the genealogical side of, of the other two modalities as outlined in the intro? So rather than modalities as some form of ideal typification um, uh, that, that could be read into your paper. Now I say this in part to flag the historical specificity perhaps of vernacular styles as they relate to particular historical claims. So to be more uh, specific, isn't there a politics of time associated with the recovery of idioms of martial prowess, traditions of sports like wrestling and lower caste assertion? as you mentioned in relation to uh, Akhara culture. And these ideas are recovered now with specific political purposes in order to gesture towards particular renderings of the past. So then the question becomes why certain memories and their associated vernacular styles and not others. And I, I, I reflect on this partly in, in light of what's going on in my own country as well. And I, I won't go into that, but you know, <laughs> there are similar processes. Um, Professor Sarangi, uh, vernacularizing the political, I was very much taken with the opening argument on how the term vernacular must not be taken to indicate parochial or traditional forms of knowledge, but those with cosmopolitan and global provenance. Um, in addition, the concept of the vernacular political in capturing the placedness and the location of vernaculars, as well as their capacity to craft new public spheres, new domains of vernacular politics, provides very useful framing, I think, for this and other papers uh, on the panel. So the question I had was what happens to the cosmopolitan and the global as your argument proceeds? For example, towards the end of the paper, you offer a kind of political history that will give us, and I quote, newer cultural and intellectual histories to work through by pushing the disciplinary boundaries of history and politics, taking vernacular seriously to elucidate the world of the political closer to people's everyday lives and socialities, uh, which is um, all, all to the good, but where is the global in this? So is this principally an argument that's global in a comparative sense, again, i.e. affording equal weight um, to differing vernaculars and political spheres, or does the project offer more in highlighting the cosmopolitan and global provenance of vernaculars, uh, as you mentioned in the introduction? Um, Dr. Singh, very useful paper for thinking through the semantic range of Dharma and Samaj and indeed, perhaps maybe enough isn't made of the latter in the framing of the paper on, on the, the conceptual um, range or semantic range of, of Samaj, which I found very useful. 
as an almost aside, I was reading this alongside Rabindranath Tagore's uh, Greater India, which was helpful for me placing that particular, and this was helpful for me to place that particular work in context. And equally useful is the argument you make in the closing section on the multiple temporalities at play in the articulation of these conceptual assemblages, Dharma and Samaj, that performed the crucial functions for the politics of emergent Hindu nationalism. But one area that I wanted to hear more on was on the delineation of Samaj as social and the concept of the social Dharma seems significant since it carves out a domain the social rooted in a vernacular samaj that performs specific political work as you highlight an escape from communalism but of course there's also an escape from the perceived epistemic imperialism of european idioms of governance and political thought and that's certainly present in in tagore's art articulation and he uses both of these terms right in the, in, in the introduction of chapters to that work um, and it's present in the work of other nationalist figures as well, for example, Hadayal's notion of social conquest. So in that sense, we also see in Samaj, don't we, uh, in, in Samaj Dharma, uh, an instance of what Olivia Rutatibwa has termed ethical retreat or maybe epistemic retreat that places this terminology in a wider anti-colonial imaginary that maybe has transnational connections. Uh, I think it's very interesting the way that these ideas become essentialized and emergent at the, precisely the moment, you know, that, that moment that Chris Manjapra terms as the age of entanglement, the difference is... the name of the author again? Okay. That's Olivia Rutatibwa. I'll send you a, a link after this. Um, okay, please do. Thank you. So the Indian overseas organizations, then their cultivation and reflection back of new visions of Indian culture, in adverted commas, as a means of advancing their cause. Again, that, that sort of circulatory kind of uh, transnational global movements that is significant here. So here, Anderson's imagined communities may not be so important as his other work on anarchist internationalists, Jose Rizal, uh, for example, whose recovery of the folk tradition of Philippine communities was fostered in transnational and global entanglements and circuits. Um, just one additional point. Actually, I'll leave that, sorry. Time, time, is, <laughs> time is pressing. And then finally, Dr. Mitra, um, I'm very much interested in this paper and its focus on Benoit Kumar Sarkar, whose works I'm looking at in the different context of international political thought. So I wanted to hear more on your understanding of domains of knowledge as they relate to, or perhaps express a vernacular idiom. In your closing section, you say this double moment of translation between experience and data assumed an archival historical modality. Um, and, and I'm, I'm just wondering, does the vernacular circumscribe these domains of knowledge, or rather is the vernacular domain the domain of data as such? That I, I wasn't quite clear, maybe I needed to read it more closely, I wasn't quite clear on what the vernacular is, if you see what I mean. And then the question arises from this is how this process of translating experience into calculability differs from some genre of governmentality, perhaps colonial governmentality, maybe anti-colonial governmentality, some variant of modernist political economy. And I mention this principally because Foucault creeps into your analysis in the closing stages. Um, there's another point on the influence of Satis Mukherjee uh, on, on Sarkar. I mean, if you look at the science of history and the hope of mankind, one of his other works, you see much more of a neo-Hegelian influence coming through perhaps uh, Brajendranath Seale's um, work, his PhD mentor at Calcutta University. And I hate to ask, I mean, this is apparently Manu Goswami's work, for example, but I hate to ask, where is Hegel in this? Because there are there are Hegelian holist kind of ideas in in some of some of the, the, the sections of your of your paper. Um, and yeah, I'll leave it there. Thanks very much. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Brady, for uh, your wonderful comments and insights. I mean, I'm aware that we have just six minutes now. And uh, so basically, you have one minute to eat to respond to each of you. And, uh, and then I'm afraid we have to wrap up and uh, perhaps, as I say, carry on the conversation privately. So uh, who wants to start uh, to respond? Yeah. OK, so this is a daunting task, but thanks so much for the lovely, lovely comments and questions. 
uh, very briefly, I would like to have this conversation going on. Uh, one way in which I was trying to think about the gesture towards the global in the vernacular in my paper was focusing on the practice of aestheticism and its connection with subject formation. So I think there can be transnational connections there and there's a reason why I chose the communist example because I think there are parallels and connections to be made, something that I would like to explore and completely, you know, agree with you and thank you so much for underlining the specific issue of politics of time in the recovery of certain kind of meanings like Akhara and Ashram. Once again, I think it has a lot to do with <clears throat> politics of subject making. So Akharas and Ashrams as sites of certain kind of kinds that are beginning to be privileged now. So I'll stop there, but I would like to keep this conversation going. Thank you very much. Asha, you're muted, Asha. Oh, I'm sorry. Um, thank you, Dr. Bailey. I think wonderful set of questions and further uh, making us think through some of the connections, which I think uh, I have not made in the paper. But uh, this is absolutely uh, necessary that uh, the concept of vernacular uh, must be connected or in what ways it can be connected uh, to the global uses of it. So I would like to say that the linguistic registers uh, use certain specific uh, you know, indexicalities and referentialities, just to give you one example, where language use is seen have performing these two tasks among many others. And the linguistic registers have certain kind of a global, uh, you know, uh, a global uh, sort of uh, form. So despite the regional languages, um, there will be uh, a common platform, a common performativity, a common poetic. So that's one. Second is the manner in which the democratic iterations and democratic enunciations of the idea of, let's say, public sphere or rights or, or, or citizenship, there is a certain global language and the manner in which the vernacularization of particular languages connects to the globalization of it and globalization connects to the vernacularization of it. So I think it's a two way process, but it some, seems to be intimately connected. Let me give you just an example of for the use of political rhetoric or oratory for that matter, or the body language. So you can make the connections between the global and the local or the vernacular and the, and, and the non-vernacular languages. Multilingual dialogical interactions. I think all societies of the world are multilingual. So there are ways in which they connect. For example, it is now said um, that the Indian languages which are competing with other languages at the global transnational level, they've all become global languages. There are networks of interactions and that affects uh, the market interactions among them. So how do different languages compete with one another? I mean, the older debate between English and non-English languages is no longer very useful because the Indian languages have reached a kind of a global provenance. So it is in that sense, I was using the global and the vernacular. Uh, and political languages of state power, I think across the globe, there are certain common vocabularies, there is certain common grammar in which the leadership style uses it, in which the common citizenry uses it, in which the language of freedom and language of rights is you know, used. So I think language as a category or as a conceptual category can enable us to think through and go beyond the vernacular and connect with the global and bring the global back to the local. So that's where I would like to connect. To. Sorry, I can't. Thank you once again. Yes. No, we, we yeah, thanks because we have a few minutes and uh, Marinda and uh, was, have, have not kind of given their comments. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Sorry about that. Uh, Mohinder, there, uh, please. Okay, uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Bailey. Uh, great comments, uh, very useful. I'll be in touch with you in the future if you don't mind. Uh, so in, in terms of global entanglements, yes, a great question to think about further. Uh, Sartori's work himself points out uh, the 
culture concept and which is not included in my paper but it is part of the project sanskriti sabhyata uh, both second is what faisal devji points out in relation to these sorts of universalism this uh, this availability of the global humanity as a matter of fact not just a regulative idea i think he's taking this from an arrangement so that's one i'll further think about it uh, in relation to temporality i'm trying to think with uh, the brian Hatch hatcher's new book uh, be of hinduism before reform where he's trying to uh, uh, ask that uh, say that we need to go beyond the framing of reform and uh, limit so sort of provincialism uh, your uh, reform itself and uh, so that's another um, Uh, the third one is Tagore's concept of samaj uh, is uh, relevant and important, but uh, I I have written on Tagore and where I am actually arguing uh, Tagore's concept of samaj is very different from this kind of concept of samaj that is there in Hindu nationalist and social reform discourses. Uh, on one count, I think. Uh, Uh, that is not as it's not nationalist concept Tagore so first of all because it seems to escape the sort of some sort of kind of bio political framing that emerges in Hindu nationalism that's my hunch let's see what comes out okay thank you Ivan your you have the last your last word. <laughs> Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Veli, for those wonderful comments. I think we need to have a longer conversation uh, beyond uh, this uh, thing. Uh, mm -hmm. First of all, I would like to say very quickly: for me, vernacular is sort of a domain of prefiguration, displacement, sometimes distortion as well. And in that sense, it's a relational domain. It's a relational category. And obviously, I mean, we can talk more about the relationship between the global and the local. Vernacular can I can never associate vernacular with the local. In fact, this experiment that I'm talking about, which would seem like that it's a, it was an experiment towards in that direction, but obviously it was a failed experiment. And actually, that is something I'm curious about: why it failed and how it failed. That's something which would be very interesting to see. The the distinction between colonial governmentality and the kind of vernacular experimentation which is going here is, I think, it it can be sought in this double movement of translation itself. Because colonial governmentality is mostly focused on this movement of experience translated into data, which you see all these surveys and uh, what the, the moralities that Bernard Cohen talks about. But here, this is something which is very interesting happening in case of this other movement, the reversal of the movement, where data is being claimed to be translated into experience from within colonial governmentality. I don't think a demand for a national life table could arise. More interestingly. This was obviously in the you know in the in the lifetime of colonial power, colonial existence in India that didn't happen. Obviously, the data was being sent to the to England or to wherever uh, they wanted to, and and that was being calibrated to you know their uh, life expectancies. But the point is that, and and obviously after independence, it would become a moot question. I mean, who would make that question of uh, who would make, make that demand of Indian life table? I mean, the whole notion of Indian would change there. It's obviously it, again. That's why I'm saying that vernacular is a relational category in that sense. Only we, from within the colonial encounter, that kind of a vernacular can exist and can be presented and can be politicized as well. Now the discussion about the other point, which I would like to make, which is sort of a biographical point, how this whole network was working in Bernard Shaw's own life history, which you are very much aware of, that his collaborations with the fascists, his uh, correspondence with Corrado Gini. And and his you know this inspiration, uh, Wilfredo Pareto, the one of the like, biggest thinkers of fascism, as his inspiration, and his his entire career of you know thinking of a materialist tradition of Indian sociology and Indian Indian political sciences, along with the exact sciences, all of that, and then you encounter the fact that this guy was running for twenty years of his life a journal every month he was publishing hundred pages for twenty years in Bengal. now what is the what is the location of that language in his you know illustrious career where he was writing in five languages at least he was writing in english in bangla in italian in french in german so which one is the vernacular this is actually i would like to ask i am saying i am using i am working on bangla because this is the language that i know but somebody may work on his italian writings and may 
I mean, then how would we categorize that? So these are some of the very interesting questions that are that I'm thinking about, and I would like to share Thanks. some of uh, my writings with you, and uh, hopefully we'll have a longer conversation. Thank you. Thanks, uh, Dr. Mitra, and thank you, everybody. I'm really sorry, but we need to wrap up now, as uh, Shivat is telling us that we are over time, and uh, of course we could have had a cup of tea and carry on the discussion if we were in person, but uh, online this is not possible. Uh, hopefully, hopefully we're going to meet up soon again all together. Uh, uh, and anyway, it will be great. I will send some some of you some questions by email, so maybe we can carry on the conversation like that. Uh, Shubhata, do you want to add something? Um, just, we... just, just a final round of thank you to everyone. Lucia, you were lovely as a as a moderator. That was very well done. <laughs> And uh, thank you, Martin. Lovely comments to all the presenters. Thank you so much. Your presentations were absolutely fabulous. And I will definitely be in touch over email with questions for sure. Thank you okay. so much for joining us all today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thanks.